Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Perhatch. I'm the managing partner of the Milwaukee Office of Security, and I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming you here on this 70-degree day in February in Milwaukee. I swear to you, we did not know that it would be 70 degrees outside when we invited you all to come for this CLE on immigration. Um, and especially since it's supposed to be 30 degrees and snow on Saturday, I really appreciate the fact that you guys all showed up. Um, thanks to Amy Westrup and the Wisconsin Association for Corporations, Corporate Council, um, and all of you guys for joining us today. Um, and um, welcome. I hope you'll be able to stay and enjoy the cocktail hour. I'm sort of grateful that we started this at 3 as opposed to starting it at 4 so that we're not keeping you here until 6. Um, but I have the um, honor of introducing to you today um, two of our um, immigration attorneys here at Corals and Brady, Grant Sovereign, um, who is housed in our Madison office that spends quite a bit of time in our Milwaukee office as well, and Eric Ledbetter from our Chicago office. So I will let them take this away on a topic that seems to change daily based upon what you read in the newspaper. Um, when I read the paper this morning, I read uh, five ways Trump will increase deportation. Faster deportations, more agents, jails, judges, a return to Mexico, deputizing local police, and expanding the wall. So I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say about... That was it. You just took it all away. That was it. That was all we were going to do now. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> we get right to the point at Quarles and Brady. It's the top five of everything. <laughs> we only have the top two immigration lawyers, though, for you today, to, for your pleasure. So we just wanted to talk, uh, start with a few things. Uh, about our webinar for people who are here. Um, so to make sure that you're at the right place, this is the Immigration Issues for Employers and Employees, the New Immigration Landscape under the Trump Administration. And I'm Grant Sovereign. I chair our nationwide immigration business immigration practice. And this is my colleague, Eric Ledbetter, who is also a partner who is in our Chicago office. He works with a lot of high-tech companies and universities and hospitals and doing all sorts of business-related immigration. Um, we've got lots of immigration lawyers who did different things, so we have uh, asked all of them to give us their best input to try and give you the highlights of what's happening now. We're not going to go through all the details, of course, because you don't want to know it, but we thought, you know, as in-house lawyers, there are some things that all of a sudden you do need to know about. It used to be you could sort of shunt this off to the HR people or somebody in labor and employment, but now there are a lot of questions. What are companies going to do with their workforce? Uh, what are people going to do if authorities come to our facilities and want to talk to people or cart them away? So there are some things that I think um, have risen to the level of needing the people at the top to think about now. So a few housekeeping things about the webinar. We're going to apply for one hour of CLE credit today. So if you're an attorney and you want to receive CLE credit and you're attending today's program by webinar, webinar you have to download and fill out this form that is in the handouts panel of the webinar dashboard. So complete that form and return it to Lisa Frymark in our office, and her contact information is at the bottom of that document. We've muted everybody's phone lines who are participating in the webinar today, and so you will not be able to speak. We will not be able to hear you. You can go ahead and speak if you'd like, but we're, uh, you're in listen-only mode, and we'd like you to be aware that the presentation is being recorded. An electronic survey will be emailed to you after the program so you can give us some ideas about how to make it better for the future. If you do have questions and you're on the webinar, you can type your question in the Q&A box that's in the upper right-hand corner of that dashboard and submit it. And then whether we like it or not, we will read the question and uh, answer it. So, and for other people who will be here today, just uh, we're going to repeat your question for those same purposes so everybody can hear. So. We are, I'm going to keep my phone right here so if I get tweets while we're doing this, I can actually explain because <laughs> there's a chance that today there's going to be a new um, travel ban or partial ban or uh, slowdown for some people. Uh, so there might be a chance that we actually have something new to talk about since you arrived. But to understand how really this fits into context, I find when I go and speak to people that we're not even talking about the same things. So I don't want to... Uh, you know, pretend like we're in the kindergarten of the legal world, but most people probably didn't take immigration class. And e even like me, who did take immigration class and thought he was going to be an immigration lawyer, I went to my first immigration interview after I graduated from law school. And about 10.30 at night before, I said to my wife, my God, I don't know what a green card is. So I took out the, my textbook, which was all, you know, um, it was legal cases. And I had to go to the back, and it said green card. And there was only one index entry for what green card was, and I had to go figure out what it was. 
Turns out I've been learning about it throughout law school and didn't know that it was called a green card. So I'm going to try and explain to you some of those things so that we can have a discussion about what is actually happening right now and so that when people come to you and say the wrong thing, you can correct them and make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So we're going to start here with uh, an overview of the U.S. immigration system. There are basically three levels of immigration benefits in the United States, so we can talk about the same things. The first level are what's called non-immigrant visas, and this is like the whole alphabet soup of visas to come and temporarily do something in the United States. Then the second level of benefits are green cards. Uh, it's technically called lawful permanent resident status. That's what I learned in law school. But then when I came out, everybody calls it a green card, and apparently not because Gerard Depardieu was so fabulous in the movie Green Card, but because for a couple of decades the card was green, it turned white, and then it was pink for a long time. I noticed nobody is calling it the pink card, and the government finally gave up and put a green stripe across it so we can all keep calling it a green card again. Probably that was only like seven or eight years ago, and it is green card again now. Third level of immigration benefits is U.S. citizenship, and the fourth, which ends up taking most of the time in the press are undocumented people who are here in the U.S. and maybe as many as 11 million people. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the agencies that, um, that enforce these immigration rules. So to start with, non-immigrant visas. The thing that they all share, and these are the things people get them at your companies right now, are like H-1B visas or L-1 visas. The thing that they all share, though, in these non-immigrant visas is you don't tend to immigrate permanently to the United States. So it's a non-immigrant visa. And you have to do only the thing that the government says you can do. So you apply, you file a petition with the government and say, I'm only going to work for American Family Insurance and I'm only going to be an actuary in this field. If you change and you're not an actuary anymore and you jump up to be the general counsel, you're out of status now. You can be deported because you're not doing the same job that you told the government you were doing. Um, you also can't stay indefinitely with any of these. So that's what they all share. You've got to keep doing the same thing that you told the government you were going to do, and you've got to stay within a certain period of time. You can extend things. Usually the longest you can stay with most of these is up to seven years. But it's, all, it's a whole list that goes from A all the way down to V, and you can see we put some of these on the materials. But an H-1B is the most common type of work visa, but there's only 85,000 of them every year. So it's not like companies all across America have them. You have to have at least a bachelor's degree to do it. But interestingly, it does not require that you test the labor market. A lot of times companies call and say, well, we got this person, but you know, I'm not sure if you know, we might be able to find another American. Usually people don't even call us because they know it might cost a little money to get an H-1B, so they hire somebody else, which is perfectly fine. But there's no legal requirement that you test the labor market and prove there are no other Americans who can do it. L1s are intercompany transferees, so if you have foreign offices, you want to transfer somebody in. F1s are students, or J1s are the same thing. As far as I know, NAFTA still exists as of when we started today. And so there is a TN category for trade NAFTA for Canadians and Mexicans who are professionals and can come to the U.S. and do certain jobs. And then B1, B2s are visitors who come. Um, we've had to be careful with this a lot because uh, it's so easy to get a B1, B2 visa to come temporarily to the U.S. as a visitor for business or just to visit Disneyland that a lot of times you'll see people in your company coming for, uh, to do a temporary job with the visitor visa that they have. And that's one of the things where you really got to be careful. These days it's becoming much more, there's a lot more scrutiny about people who are traveling as visitors and come to the U.S. So if you see your colleagues from other offices outside the United States here a lot, you might just make sure that they're, they actually have a work visa and aren't doing work on one of these visitor visas. And then people uh, with O1s are, uh, have extraordinary ability. Eric's already wondering how on earth we're going to have enough time to get through all the slides if he's going to talk that much. Next are immigrant visas. And this is, these are the green cards. That means you can stay indefinitely in the United States. It's a lawful permanent resident. Some people call it an immigrant visa because you do intend to stay permanently in the United States. You can travel in and out as much as you want. Um, the, the government can take it away if you commit certain crimes or if you leave the United States for too long of a period. You basically have to intend to stay permanently. That doesn't mean you get rid of your citizenship from wherever you came. So you would be a citizen of Germany, but you're a permanent resident in the United States. But the most most misunderstood thing about green cards is how to get them. I don't know, maybe you've heard in the press a few times, if people only came the legal way, 
The problem is there are not very many legal ways to come and stay. And I think that's what most people mean when they say they're coming to the United States. It means you're getting a green card and you want to stay permanently. But there are only four ways to come and stay permanently in the United States. Number one is you have a family sponsor. And this doesn't, doesn't just mean, you know, someone in my family is going to say, oh, I sponsor you. It's a very long process. And it has to be someone who already is a citizen or has a green card in the United States. And you have to have a very close family relationship with them. It has to be your spouse, your parent, your child, or your sibling. But, and that sounds like, well, that's, that's not so bad. I might have some of those. But there's a huge discrepancy in how long it takes depending on that relationship and what status the person has. So the fastest you can get a green card to come to the U.S. anymore is if you're married to a U.S. citizen, and it takes a year. So that's the fastest. That's the best you can do. Uh, most times people say to me, it's going to take a whole year. And I say, look. Thank God you're not the sibling of somebody from the Philippines because to get a green card from there takes 22 years. So it's from that, and it's not like I just picked the longest one. I mean, there are plenty that are 15 years and 10 years and 12 years all along that. So it's not really a viable system if you have one of those relationships. It just means someday you may be able to get a green card. And then employer sponsorship. My uncle Clem runs a fix-it shop. He's going to sponsor me so I can get a green card that way, right, Grant? No. This is where you have to show that there are no Americans who can do the job. So this is a standard way to get a green card through employer sponsorship is to run advertisements for six months in the internet, on the Internet and in newspapers and prove that no American applied who was qualified for the job. So you can imagine there are a lot of jobs that don't qualify for that. And most of our clients don't call up and say, you know, I want to get a, a green card for somebody through this process where we could find somebody else anyway, because it can cost a lot of money. It could take at least two or three years to get it. But if you're from India, China, Philippines, or Mexico, where there are lots of people coming to the United States, it could easily take 15 years to get that green card, where you're proving to the government that we can't find somebody today to do this job. And the government says, OK, you can get that guy in 15 years. So obviously, the system is not working so well right now based on the kind of need that we have. Then we got. The green card lottery, it wouldn't be America if we weren't giving away green cards in a lottery. But even that's not so easy, right? 50,000, 55,000, the government gives away to maybe 11 or 12 million applicants. And there again, it's not for people coming from countries where there are already a lot of immigrants to the United States. So Canada, Mexico, England, almost all of Europe, most of Asia can't use this because they're already sending a lot of people. So it ends up being a lot of people from the Caribbean and Africa who get to use these. And then the fourth way to get a green card is if you're an asylee or a refugee and you, you're, you've been here for a year, you almost automatically get a green card. So that's it. There's no like, I come to the border and I fill out an application. That doesn't exist anymore. There was a lady, she was standing in New York Harbor. She used to welcome a lot of people. Not anymore. You can't just come and fill out an application. These are the only ways to get green cards now. So. The difference between having a green card and citizenship, then, is once you become a citizen, you can vote in elections, and the government can't take your citizenship away. Like if you commit certain crimes, we get to commit whatever crimes we want if we're citizens, and you don't get deported. Unless you lied to get citizenship. You know, sometimes you hear about, there was always some uh, worker in Detroit in, a, in one of the American, uh, in the car industry, who was like a Nazi uh, camp um, guard, and that person was a citizen and they got denaturalized. And it wasn't because they actually did those things, it was because they lied to get their citizenship. So literally, once you become a citizen, you can't, they can't take it away from you for anything that you used to do. It's only lying to get it. So there are only three ways to become a citizen. Number one is if you're born in the United States, the Constitution, the way it is still right now when we started today, was if you're born in the United States, you are a U.S. citizen. If you're born outside the United States to U.S. citizen parents, you're also a U.S. citizen. Or if you've had a green card for at least five years, or three if you're married to a U.S. citizen, then you can apply to naturalize to become a citizen. So, you know, the pathway to citizenship, which a lot of people use sort of off the cuff, you know, this is going to be a pathway to citizenship, usually means going through all this. Like if you started for example, with undocumented people. There's no way to jump into any of these other statuses without leaving the United States. If you leave the U.S., you're barred from coming in for a long time. So, you know, there have been proposals in Congress 
to have temporary statuses to begin to move in a pathway to citizenship, that just gets you into that first level, the non-immigrant visas, where you may be for five, ten years. Then you get a green card, which may take five or ten years to get that green card. Then once you get your green card, you have to wait five years to become a citizen. So the path to citizenship in the United States is a very long and complicated path. You know, thank God it's given me this nice suit. Otherwise, um, it wouldn't be so uh, difficult for people. But it's you know, who knows what's going to happen now, and that's what we're trying to figure out today is some of the things that will change. So the government agencies now is for Eric. All right. Um, well, okay, that was the funny part of the presentation. <laughs> Here goes my part now. Um, government agencies. So if you came over to my house in the last couple of weeks to watch the um, immigration news with me, you'd probably hear me yelling at the TV all day because they don't, the reporter just don't get it right. Uh, they confuse the agencies all the time. And so we thought that's probably pretty common and we would just uh, just do a little tutorial on the different agencies uh, because when you watch the news they have CBP giving visas out and TSA checking people when they come into the country and just all kinds of stuff. So um, the and you might also think that it's mostly just the immigration service but there's really a lot of different agencies that get into the act. So we have um, obviously the uh, Department of Homeland Security and um, after 9-11 uh, when Homeland Security was created and the government was sort of restructured, uh, before that we had the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and they did all these various things related to immigration. Uh, and so after DHS was created, the thinking was they would take INS and split it up into its three main parts and then put those as three separate agencies under DHS. That made it easier for Congress to give money to the parts of the agency that it prefers, i.e. enforcement, um, and, uh, and then also just made it easier to run the agencies so they aren't at cross purposes with each other. So um, the one that we work with a lot is Citizenship and Immigration Services. They're the ones with the goodies. They give out the green cards and the work permits and the travel permits and visa statuses, things like that. Uh, and then Customs and Border Protection, they are the folks at the, mostly at the airports, also the land crossings and seaports. And uh, so they're the ones who will look at your passport when you come back into the U.S. or if you're coming for, for the first time. They check your visa and ask you why you're coming, how long you plan to stay, what are you going to do while you're here, that sort of thing. And after that inspection process, then they admit you into the U.S. in a particular status for a particular amount of time. Um, and they also run the Border Patrol, which are the folks mostly on the southern border, um, you know, watching out for people who are coming, uh, trying to come in without entry and inspection. Um, and then we have ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They do the interior enforcement. Um, and so for most of us in this room, that means I-9 enforcement. So, of course, um, companies have to do an I-9 form for all new hire employees since 1986 have to verify the new hire employee's identity and their work authorization, fill out the form, and then maintain the form. And sometimes ICE comes around, they want to check out your form and just make sure everything's in order. If they find um, mistakes or violations, then they can issue fines for each violation they find. And uh, those fines can really add up. And so that's ICE that does that. And by the way, there is a brand new I-9 book uh, that just came out from the government. And so if you, you can get it online, just Google M274, or you can reach out to me or Grant, and we'll send you a nice color spiral-bound copy like this. Uh, it's nice to have it um, just to refer to when you're doing your I-9s. It's one of the only things where the government actually shows you how to do something that makes sense in the immigration area. And you could be a big hit when you go back and say, here is how you do all the I-9s, because it really does it walks people through how to do it uh, who are in HR. Yeah, plus it's free. <laughs> Um, and then ICE, they also, uh, if a person ends up in deportation proceedings, the government's attorney will be from ICE. Um, so then we have the Department of State, which runs the, uh, the U.S. embassies and consulates. We have an embassy in almost every country around the world and at least one consulate. Most people uh, around the world need a visa to come to the U.S., although not, although not everyone. Canadians don't need visas for the most part. And uh, people who, some people from certain countries who are just coming to visit can come for 90 days without a visa. So just the same as 
we, most of us, I assume, as American citizens could go to France or Japan or Australia without a visa just for a you know, vacation, they can come here too. Um, but most of the people in the world need a visa and they start with the U.S. consulate to get that visa. So, it's, so they're presenting their foreign passport and then the U.S. government stamps a visa into their foreign passport. And that visa gives them the right to show up at the, um, well, it first gives them the right to get on the airplane and then to show up at a U.S. airport where they will go through that uh, inspection, uh, entry and inspection process by CBP. So an important distinction there is you can have a visa in your passport, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll be admitted into the United States. And your visa might be valid for five years or 10 years, depends on the type of visa. But when you get admitted into the U.S., that officer will tell you how long you can stay. So frequently people have a five-year visa, but they can only stay for two years on that particular trip. And they have to leave and come back, or they have to file an extension. So there's an important distinction in immigration law between having a visa and having a status in the United States. Um, and then the Department of Labor. Sometimes people are surprised to learn how involved the DOL is with immigration. Um, they run a couple of really big programs. One program is for H-1Bs. So if you're getting an H-1B, a temporary visa for an employee, you first have to start with the Department of Labor. And uh, it's mostly, their program is mostly designed around trying to ensure that employers are paying the actual and prevailing wage for their H-1B workers. So the idea is you can't bring in an H-1B worker and pay them less than you would pay American workers for doing the same job in the same place. And you also have to pay them the prevailing wage. So there's a whole system around that. There's an application that has to be submitted to the DOL and they certify it, a notice that has to be uh, placed. And all that happens under, uh, under the uh, authority of the Department of Labor. And then there's a similar but even more extensive process that you go through if you're getting a green card for an employee uh, through something called PERM. So the most common way to get an employment-based green card is through this DOL program called PERM. And in addition to showing that you're paying the prevailing wage, you also have to recruit for uh, U.S. workers and be able to demonstrate that you couldn't find a U.S. worker uh, for that job. That doesn't mean that you have to go and scour the whole country and 300 million people for a worker, but you have to run ads in the particular location for about a month and then track responses. And if nobody responded during that month who was qualified and really would want the job, then, then you can go forward uh, with hiring the foreign worker uh, on a permanent green card basis, and that's the DOL that administers that. Um, and then finally, there's the Department of Justice, um, which runs the uh, immigration court system. So uh, deportation proceedings go through the DOJ, uh, and a person would appear before an immigration judge, which is really just an ALJ. Um, and then, by the way, there's TSA, and they don't have anything to do with immigration. They just do the you know domestic security when you're getting on an airplane. All right. Um, okay, so the Trump executive orders. So I'll talk about the um, now uh, halted um, travel ban or travel suspension. Let me just I, check. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're still good on that one. Yeah, so I might say travel ban or suspension. I don't attach any particular political meaning to that. Um, uh, but, the, but the order that President Trump issued uh, in January, um, so I assume probably most people already know about this. You've probably heard about it in the news. Uh, so I won't uh, go too much on about it, but um, it was meant to apply to people from the following seven countries that are on there for 90 days. The purpose for it was uh, that the governments of these countries do not provide adequate information to the United States government for us to be able to make a decision about, you know, national security decision about whether or not to admit uh, people from these countries. And, um, and so the idea was pause things for 90 days, give these governments an opportunity to provide an extensive set of information requests uh, to the U.S. government. And then at that point, uh, we would decide or the president would decide what to do. Um, the reality of it is, you know, our relationships with the governments in most of these countries are pretty uh, weak or non-existent, so the odds that they're going to provide extensive documentation and information are pretty low. So the 90-day suspension would very likely become an indefinite suspension. Um, and um, 
so that that travel ban or travel suspension, uh, as probably everybody knows, was stayed by um, a federal district court in Seattle, and then the Ninth Circuit upheld that temporary stay, and that's where it's at now. The administration has the option to take that on to the Supreme Court or to go back and litigate in district court, but it seems like what they're probably most likely to do and what's probably going to come out today or tomorrow or maybe Friday is just a new, uh, more closely tailored executive order. Um, a couple of the problems, um, just from a legal perspective, with the order that was issued is, um, you know, it appears that it didn't go through the traditional vetting process and the interagency um, processes and attorney review. And you can sort of tell that when you read it uh, with an immigration lawyer's eye because uh, in some instances they used legal immigration, legal terminology that it seemed like they didn't know what the words meant. <laughs> um, and in other instances they used uh, layman's terms, which you can't do, and you know, if you have a class of people and you're trying to determine who can be admitted and who can't, who needs to be asked more questions and who doesn't, um, who's subject to this, who isn't subject, it, you have to have that legal precision. And so some examples, the order actually, um, the, uh, just the language of the order says that it applies to immigrants and non-immigrants, which we know from Grant means people coming temporarily, it also means permanent residents. But within a day, the administration came out and said, well, no, we didn't mean for it to apply to immigrants. We only meant non-immigrants. And so I think they, uh, it looks to me like they had copied and pasted part of a provision from the Immigration and Nation Nationality Act that said immigrants and non-immigrants. And I think that's where that came from. But now, um, if it were to be lifted, it wouldn't apply to uh, immigrants, meaning green card holders. Um, it also talks about uh, people from these countries, but we wouldn't use that terminology normally. We're much more specific. We would say someone whose country of birth was one of these countries, or nationality, or dual nationality. Um, so for instance, if someone was, say, born in Iran, but then they came to the United States on a student visa in the 1970s, and then eventually through the process became a US citizen in the 1990s, and then renounced their Iranian citizenship, at this point, they would just be a U.S. citizen. But in layman's terms, you would say they're from Iran, but they're not from Iran in any other sense, in any legal sense. And if they were not allowed back into the U.S., they would have no place on earth to go to uh, because they wouldn't have citizenship anywhere else. So, um, you know, again, it's it just uh, it shows, I think, why the new order will have to be a lot more specific in order to, um, to um, survive the courts. But... Uh, what uh, what they eventually came around to was people who are dual nationals, so either one of these countries from, you're a citizen of one of these countries and the United States or some other country. If you're, uh, if you're also a dual national with the United States, then you could enter, you wouldn't be blocked. If you're even a dual national with one of these countries and another country, like say Canada, and you were entering on your Canadian passport, then you would be able to enter. Um, but if you have any sort of touch with one of the designated countries, whether you were born there or you share a nationality with one of those countries, or maybe you're just a U.S. citizen who went to one of those countries for a visit, um, then uh, you would be able to be readmitted, but you'd have to go through a lot more questioning. And you might be subject to a full search, a search of your emails, your phone, your laptop, um, uh, social media, and that sort of thing. Um, so, okay, so that's it for the Trump executive order for now, unless in the next 30 minutes something new comes out. There were two more that were signed actually before the, um, before the travel ban uh, that were signed on the 17th of January, and those are the ones where the DHS has now just issued two implementation orders yesterday, the day before. And those now have, you know, you think, well, it doesn't really apply to the employees I have, but maybe they do, maybe it does. But it's interesting, what we've heard a lot from people, employees, and other people, is that nobody really knows who it applies to, and so you end up having to uh, figure out whether it does or doesn't. So it's a good idea to figure out who it applies to so that you can tell the people that it doesn't apply to. Um, some of the things that are in this new order about interior immigration enforcement, um, the first one, there are a number of parole uh, options that the government has had to parole people into the United States. Uh, most of them you probably don't know about. The most well-known one is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. Some people call it DREAMers because there was an act that was never passed by Congress for people 
children who are brought into the United States. Um, the government says that they're not targeting or planning to, uh, to get rid of the DACA program. It's hard to know right now what is going to happen with that because one of the things that the implementation memos do is allows, there used to be um, uh, priority memos that were issued by ICE about who should be, these are the people that we need to go after first and we're not going to go after other people until we get all these people. And those were gang members, felons, and people who were a security threat to the United States. And they hadn't gotten through all of them so they hadn't started on the next level. But while the new implementation orders say we're going to concentrate on people with criminal backgrounds, meaning not only people who have been convicted, but also people who are in the process, uh, who have been accused of crimes, or who the government thinks has committed a crime for some other reason, the, the implementation order actually opens it up to ICE officers to uh, remove anybody who uh, doesn't have documents to be in the United States. So the priority has been taken, they, they'll say that the priority has been increased a little bit, but it actually takes away the prohibition from sort of an internal uh, perspective on going after anybody who's removable in the United States. So it's hard to say, it doesn't say that we're not going after people with DACA. And there are people at companies, you know, in Milwaukee and around the country who have already started to call us to ask, is this going to affect people? And the, the truth is right now we don't know what the answer to that is. The implementation order also expands opportunities for local police um, law enforcement to partner with the Immigration Service in the deportation process. Uh, there are a number of privacy protections that immigrants used to have because the Supreme Court has gone a little bit back and forth on what kind of um, due process rights non-citizens have. So Congress had added some. Um, to the, at the discretion of the uh, administration, and now those have been taken away. They're going to hire 15,000 more Border Patrol agents, 5,000 for CBP, and 10,000 for ICE. Um, that's a lot of new people to train and to explain this very complicated system to. Um, and the two biggest things are at the end are expanding the priorities. Um, and then also what is probably going to be the most interesting, um, because we haven't seen this, Congress did authorize 20 years ago something called expedited removal, where right now if you're going to be removed, which is the legal terminology for de deporting someone, if you're in removal proceedings, you have to go to a judge and you have the opportunity to hire a lawyer. There's no lawyer paid for because these are just civil proceedings. Um, there's only one criminal violation in immigration law, and that's entering the United States after previously being deported. That's the only crime that there is in immigration. So all these other are civil violations. But um, in the, um, despite it, it looks like criminal a lot of times because you get a, a judge and sometimes you're wearing an orange jumpsuit and sometimes you're shackled, but it's still a civil proceeding. Um, the, uh, these expedited removals now will take away the opportunity to go before an immigration judge. And um, it will be, it'd be sort of like pro prosecutorial discretion about deciding who this applies to and who it doesn't now. Um, for the past 20 years, it's applied to people who are just applying right at the border. The idea being, you know, if you've just come here and you don't have the right documents and you've just stepped in and we thought you were okay, but we figured out you're not, we're going to send you back and that's called expedited removal. Rather than go to a judge, you go through all the proceedings. But now it's going to be for anybody who's been in the U.S. for at least two years, and ICE thinks that you're undocumented. Um, and it also used to be within 100 miles of the border. So now it's going to be anywhere in the U.S. and it's anybody who's been here for two years or less where it used to be for 14 days. So it's going to be a dramatic increase and in taking away of judicial process from people to figure out if they're really deportable or not. Okay, um, a few weeks ago there was uh, a memo that was passed around at the White House and it somehow was leaked out. And um, so we have some sense of uh, what they have in mind for reforms to business immigration. So I'll just run through these, and then we can talk about some of the main themes uh, running through all these points. It was a pretty long memo uh, with a lot of ideas and proposals. Um, and so to be clear, we don't know which ones for sure that they'll in the end adopt or really push for, or which ones will even be successful through the legislative process. But at least it does give us some thinking about what the White House is going to be pursuing. Um, and so the first one is review all immigration regulations related to business immigration 
to uh, ensure that they're compliant with the Immigration and Nationality Act and with national security interests. Um, and then uh, the next one is proposed new parole regulations that will very likely have an effect on the DACA program. Seems like, as Grant was explaining, right now the thinking is that they would maybe uh, reform the DACA program and maybe try to do it legislatively uh, rather than just through an executive order. Um, but that's to be seen. Uh, proposed new regulations that would add additional requirements onto the H-1B and L-1 processes, which are the two most common types of work visas. Uh, consider ways to improve the H-1B lottery allocation process. So right now, uh, you know, it's a random process, and everybody has some idea about a better way to do it than through just randomness. So, you know, some ideas out there are, well, we should favor the higher salaries, we should favor small companies, we should be favoring startups, and so who knows what that might be in the end, but almost everybody that knows about immigration wants to somehow uh, allocate the visas in a different way other than just through a random lottery. Um, uh, more site visits and audits and investigations of L1 employers and uh, work sites, and then eventually add other work visa types like O1s, TNs, Es. Um, establish a commission to make immigration policy. I'm not really even sure what that means. Uh, propose new regulations that would reform the way we do our F1 student visas and our J1 cultural exchange visas. Um, and what, I've, what I'm hearing is that, uh, so right now when somebody graduates and they're on an F1 visa, after they graduate they get 12 months of work authorization. We call that OPT. And if their degree is a STEM degree, and if the company that they go to work for participates in E-Verify, so you have to have those two parts, STEM and E-Verify, then they can get an extra 24 months of work authorization. And from what I'm hearing, the administration doesn't like that extra 24 months. Um, so I think one of the overall themes there is just uh, trying to reduce the ways that people can obtain work authorization. So there's just fewer foreign workers in the U.S. Um, and then clarify the limits on the B-1 visa. So right now, it's there's some gray area. People can come as business visitors, but what does it mean to be a business visitor versus performing work? If you're coming for a meeting and you're getting paid, you know, in your job back home to come to that meeting, is that work or not? Right now, it wouldn't be if it's just a business meeting, but it seems like they're going to try to clarify that a little more. Um, and then uh, reform the H-2A program for agricultural workers. They want to do more to try to incentivize uh, employers to use E-Verify. Uh, reform the Visa Bulletin. That's every month the State Department issues a bulletin that says uh, where they're at in processing green cards for um, people by country. And so uh, there's always a lot of talk about reforming that. And then uh, new regs for the E-2 uh, investor visa. If you invest in a business in the United States, you might be able to get an E-2 visa. So they want to reform that. And, uh, and I've heard talk about adding stuff to the J-1 summer work program for foreign students. So those are some of the biggies. That's what we're going to be watching for in the next uh, few months and even in the next couple of years. I think the themes really come down to more audits, more investigations, more worksite visits, stricter rules, fewer ways to get work visas and uh, work authorization, uh, some kind of reform, if not uh, elimination of the DACA program, and uh, more incentives to try to get employers to voluntarily sign up for E-Verify if they don't get a statute that just says you have to sign up for it. So that's the administration side of um, possible reforms, but Congress has already jumped in even before uh, Inauguration Day. Some people have dragged out some old immigration bills that they've been introducing a lot, and there are a couple of new ones. So Senators Durbin and Grassley have uh, long been proponents of reforming the work visa programs in the United States, and this is a bill that they have submitted for about four years now. Um, most of it stays the same. They want to replace that H-1B lottery with a priority system for the higher salaries first. Um, they do it a little differently than one that Eric will explain. Um, they also are big into more audits and investigations of H-1B employers. The way, the way Durbin and Grassley explain it is they don't mind work visas as long as there aren't 
big Indian companies sending lots of people to the United States to work for less. I think that's basically their background. And it's true that the highest users of uh, H-1Bs, the, the most common type of work visa, which requires somebody to have a bachelor's degree and a professional level job, the, uh, the companies that use them the most are uh, companies that are in India who are known for outsourcing. But a lot of times they come to the U.S. to do this work. So one of the discussions you know, in policy circles is, what kind of outsourcing do we want? Do we want outsourcing to another country? Do we want some outsourcing that happens within our own country? Or are we going to train more people? And all three, train more Americans to do the job. All three are options right now. Um, but it would be much more difficult to bring people here to outsource parts of your company's work to people who are in the United States under these uh, proposals. Um, this is one that um, is a little bit misunderstood. Prohibit companies that employ more than 50% of their workforce on L or H visas from getting H-1Bs. These are the companies that they're talking about. If you have more than 50% of your workers in the United States have work visas, then you can't get H-1Bs anymore. There are very few probably companies like that in the room right now, so it's nothing you have to worry about. Um, and then changing the L-1 program to add a prevailing wage, like Eric was talking about with the Department of Labor, we have to prove you're paying the prevailing wage for H-1Bs. The same would be true for intra-company transferees. So if you're bringing people to the U.S. from one of your foreign entities, you just have to prove that you're paying the prevailing wage. A bill on the House side is uh, uh, Daryl Issa's bill that would raise the H-1B dependent exemption. So. Um, some companies have called up and said, does this mean we have to pay at least $100,000 now if we want to get an H-1B? But that is not the case. There, are, there is a rule that says that if a company uses a lot of H-1Bs, and that means more than 15% of your workforce has H-1Bs, you're called H-1B dependent. And if you're H-1B dependent, that means you do have to advertise for your positions before you can give them to foreign workers, unless right now, today, you pay those workers at least $60,000. If you pay somebody $60,000 and your company is H-1B dependent, then you don't have to go through the advertising process. What this bill would do would be to increase that exemption to $100,000. So you have to pay somebody at least $100,000 if you're H-1B uh, dependent in order to avoid the advertising requirements. So it doesn't mean that you have to pay H-1B workers $100,000. It's also you're exempt from running ads if the employee has at least a master's degree. They would just get rid of that altogether. So if somebody has a master's degree, makes $99,000, uh, and you use a lot of H-1Bs at your company, more than 15%, you would have to advertise and prove there are no Americans before you can give them a temporary work visa. OK, and then um, in the, on the House side, there is a proposal from Representative uh, Zoe Lofgren California. She's a former immigration attorney, so it means we love her, but nobody in Congress is going to listen to her. And you might notice that there are, uh, she doesn't have any co-sponsors, and there's no Senate sponsor either. So I'm going to go through this slide pretty quick, even though it's the most fascinating one. Um, uh, so one idea she has is, right now when you're doing prevailing wages, there are four levels, and um, she would eliminate the first level. So employers would have to start with the second level which would just mean uh, you know, lower level professionals wouldn't qualify for an H-1B or you'd have to pay them more. Um, she uh, also has an idea, and it's a really complicated formula. I read it three times and I don't understand it, but basically it can be summed up like this. The highest salaries um, would be eligible for an H-1B in the lottery first. And so you would just start with the highest and go down until you run out of H-1Bs. Which and means that only Silicon Valley is going to get all the HMB. So it's, you know, Facebook and Forward.org. There are a lot of organizations in Silicon Valley who are pushing hard for immigration. And she's in that district. And it would basically mean we'll start with those. So those of us with sensible salary structures in the Midwest would be in trouble. Yeah. Also related to that, um, so right now there's a rule that says no one country can have more than 7% of the total number of green cards per year, um, whether that would be employment-based or family-based. And, um, and so for most countries around the world, that's not a problem. But for some countries, like India and China, with gigantic populations and high rates of immigration, they max out their 7% uh, pretty quickly in a year. And then everybody else that was standing in line gets rolled forward to the next year. And then they max it out even faster the next year. And so this is a continuing snowballing problem that's been getting worse and worse for years. 
And uh, so her answer for that problem is on the employment-based side, do away with the 7% cap so, uh, so that no matter where you're from in the world, you, you would have to, you know, you would, everybody would be competing on an equal basis. There wouldn't be a 7% cap to hold back the larger countries, um, which means, you know, that the employment-based green cards would mostly then go to Indians and Chinese nationals. Uh, and then on the family-based side, she would increase the cap from 7% to 15%. Um, she's got some things that are similar to uh, Daryl Issa's bill about uh, H-1B dependency that Grant just talked about. She would also set aside, this is another Silicon Valley thing, set aside 20% of the H-1Bs for startups um, and new companies with fewer than 50 employees. And then she'd also make it easier to for students to get a green card. So right now you can't intend to be here temporarily as a student and then go off and try to get a green card because that's an expression of permanent intent. So it undermines what you've just said about intending to be here temporarily as a student. Um, and so students and also people on O's and P visas uh, would be able to do both at the same time, be here temporarily and try to get a green card. Also students fresh out of school could use experience gained with the petitioning employer to justify getting a green card. Um, and uh, also people could get uh, work permits and travel permits just based on an I-140 approval for people that do I-140s. Uh, so that's her proposals, again, probably not going anywhere. Although I think she does sort of, you know, people turn to her as an expert within the Congress, so people might borrow some from her ideas. Um, this one has a lot of traction. It's sponsored by, uh, it's in both chambers, the House and the Senate, and it's sponsored by Democrats and Republicans. It's uh, the BRID, what's called Bar Removal of Immigrants Who Dream and Grow the Economy Act, but everybody's calling it the Bridge Act. Um, and the idea there is to legislatively find a way to, um, to, uh, to give a lawful presence and a work permit to the dreamers, to the people who are DACA recipients. Right now there's about 750,000 DACA recipients in the United States, um, and they are you know, very anxious because they don't know what's going to happen. They don't have a status. They just have an understanding that the government wouldn't deport them and that they could get a work permit. So this uh, act, if it passes, would give them a, not a status but a lawful presence in the United States for three years, uh, which would give Congress time to figure out what to do next. It would basically apply to people who are under 35. They'd have to pay an application fee, prove that they don't have a criminal record, uh, and also prove that they either have graduated from high school or are actively pursuing a GED or that they have served in the military. Uh, and I think of every legislative reform proposal out there, this one probably has the best shot, and who knows if it will pass. Um, okay, so uh, what employers can do to prepare for this new landscape that we're in. Um, First of all, if you, uh, if you are a company that sponsors H-1B workers or E-3 workers, then that means you have LCAs and public access files. If you haven't looked at them and done a self-audit, uh, a really true, thorough self-audit, now's the time to do it because there's never been enforcement in this area. There are rules, but the Department of Labor has just never seen fit. They've never had the budget or the will to go and really look at these uh, files that employers have and yet, the public access file is all built around the prevailing wage and how much are you paying the person? Did you hire this person just to get uh, cheap labor? So it's politically the kind of thing that's going to attract a lot of attention. And if the DOL finds violations, they can issue fines. So it's a moneymaker for the Department of Labor. So I think if they're going to start doing audits and investigations, this is, my guess is, where they may begin. Um, and so. Stay a step ahead, look at the, uh, you know, the files that you already have, make sure they're in compliance, fix what you can, uh, and of course going forward, make sure that you're really focused on uh, LCA compliance, because I think that's probably one of the next big things to hit. The other thing uh, that's big is E-Verify. That is coming. Eventually they're going to have a federal law that requires E-Verify. It's just a matter of time. And uh, so if you're not using E-Verify and you know, maybe you're interested in it, maybe now's the time to take a look. Uh, it is offered free of charge from the government. Uh, you do it at the same time that you fill out your I-9. You fill out the I-9 first, and then you just put the information into E-Verify. It'll tell you if the person's not authorized to work or if there's some problem. 
the employee then is given an opportunity to go try to straighten it out with the government agencies. And uh, if they can, then they come back and work for you. If they can't, then you have to terminate them. Um, but it prevents you from making a, a mistake at the time of hiring in the way that you can if you're only doing I-9s. E-Verify use also gives you a rebuttable presumption if you ever get in trouble with ICE. It's not a get out of jail free card, but at least the presumption is sort of going in your favor um, that you were trying to uh, comply. Um, similarly, if you haven't looked at your I-9s recently, now's a good time to look at those. Uh, they can generate real fines. Um, and also, because we think there's going to be a big increase in site visits, if you haven't already talked to your, um, you know, your HR managers, your business managers, your sponsored employees, you might just want to let them know that, that we're expecting there's going to be an increase in random visits. It doesn't mean anybody did anything wrong. They're just checking out the system and making sure that uh, people are doing what they said they were doing. Um, and also make sure whoever is at the front desk, your receptionist or whoever, knows what to do if they get a site visit. Uh, first and foremost, yes. Yeah, sure. Well, you don't need a warrant. Can you um, just repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, if you get a site visit from one of these agencies, do they have to have a warrant? Um, and uh, they, they don't need a warrant. They can, um, but then again, you don't have to open the door and let them in to do whatever they want, you know. But if somebody shows up and says, we just want to talk to the employee that's sponsored and ask a couple of questions, uh, they can do that. And, um, and, you know, the best thing to do is cooperate and answer their questions. If you don't know the answer, um, if they're asking things you just don't know, say, I don't know, uh, you have the right to, you know, call an attorney. Uh, you have the right to look at the file first. Um, those are the things that I would recommend doing. Uh, also have your front end staff um, put them in a neutral space. Don't just say, well, you know, walk around while I find so-and-so. Put them in a conference room, ask them if they'd like a cup of coffee. And they'll stay in there until the person comes. And then when the HR person or the legal person, whoever, uh, goes in, you're, it's fine to say, what is this in regard to? Can I see your ID? Um, who, which employee? Do you mind if I go get the file and look at it? And you can just leave them sitting there. You can also say, today's a really busy day. Could we schedule this? Could I call you back on Tuesday and we could go over this on the phone? They'll usually, you know, they're usually willing to do that. Um, and, uh, and then also, uh, you know, it seems like now they're probably going to be coming from more than just one agency. So it could be the Department of Labor. It could be uh, this agency called Fraud Detection and National Security. So it's just really important to have your people ask for their identification. Because as we have an increase in site visits, we're going to have an increase in scams. People are going to show up saying that they belong to the government when they really don't. And the consequence, just to be clear, these are for people where you have employees who already have H-1B visas or L-1 visas. You have sponsored them, and someone comes to check from Department of Labor or Homeland Security to see if they really work there, is everything true in their application. So the consequence of saying, no, I won't let you in, you could say that, would be that they will go back and cancel that H-1B or L-1 until they, because it's not a right for you to have it. It's, you've asked for it, they've given it to you, and they're trying to confirm that all the facts that you submitted were true. So if you don't do it, they're done, but you can certainly say no. Yeah, and then we're almost out of time, so I'll just skip the last couple of ones. Okay, and this, um, so other things that an employer should do that are much more complicated, <laughs> uh, and that is what happens if there's a tra uh, travel ban, and what do you do with employees from these certain countries? You know, here a company has to decide, uh, you know, like anything else with employees, how much are we going to get into employees' lives? But if they go on a business trip and they can't come back, maybe it behooves us to figure out if our employees uh, are citizens of other countries too. They may have a green card and you have no idea where they're from. But, um, and I'm going to ask Judy Williams to just stop me when I start saying things wrong for uh, employment law here in the United States. But you, you can ask the employees for these purposes, you know, where they're also citizens. They may have gone through the I-9 process already and they're in the country. Please don't fire them after you ask this question. Uh, but if uh, you know where they're from, you can help and make sure that you're not sending people off who can't come back. And let's hope that they know where they're going 
But there are a lot of big companies who are sending people who had folks caught when the last uh, travel ban occurred, and they asked us, where are our employees from? And we only knew for the ones that we had gotten them immigration benefits. But there are a lot of people who might have joined your company who have green cards but are a citizen somewhere else, or maybe they're getting a green card through their spouse, and so you didn't have anything to do with getting them immigration status. So it might be time to think about if a new travel ban comes out, where people are from. Is it important to talk to your employees about their rights and responsibilities when coming back into the United States? Here again, uh, you know, on a public policy basis, it looks like we're shifting towards uh, asking more questions and maybe a little bit more infringing into people's uh, civil rights or, you know, the rights that they have under the Constitution for security purposes. So the, the yin and the yang of that is maybe we'll get some more security, but there will be a lot more questions. So what are you going to send people with? Um, there are, the CBP right now says they have the right to look at anything that you have with them when somebody's coming back into the United States. That's a U.S. citizen or not a U.S. citizen. So are you going to send somebody who has a telephone now where they have said they're going to ask people a lot more questions uh, with, you know, emails on their phone? I mean, CBP suggested you should travel with a different phone, which seems a little bit crazy, but they really believe they have the right. The courts have not uh, definitively decided what rights people have in these situations right now. One circuit says that CBP has to actually at least have a reasonable suspicion of something going on before they can do forensics on your telephone or your laptop. But this has already happened. They will ask for it. And so you have to decide who is traveling with what if there is sensitive material. Now again, it's CBP or ICE. Does it matter that much if they see your uh, private information? But if you're a lawyer, and you have ethical responsibilities to somebody, you may not be able to do that, but CBP doesn't care about that. And it seems crazy to have to talk about this. And I'm not saying that the government is going to look into everybody's phone every single time, but if they have some reasonable suspicion, um, they may have the right to do it. And in many cases, even if they don't have a reasonable suspicion, they will ask that. And you have to know what the difference is and be able to tell them. If you're a U.S. citizen, you're going to come out of this thing. Uh, you're going to be able to enter the United States. But if you have employees who have a green card even or are coming in with a visa and they tell the government, CBP, you know, I have this phone and it's, you know, sensitive material and I can't let you look at it, they could, um, they could bar the person from entering the United States because they're not uh, participating with, you know, their investigation. So the consequences of that are different for who is entering the United States. Who also has the right to have a lawyer? A U.S. citizen is the only one who has the right to have a lawyer at an airport or a border crossing right now uh, with the case law that exists. So, um, you know, there, there might be some training. But this is if you have people who are really traveling a lot and have, have important information that you don't want them to give up. And then the second thing is not for people who are traveling, but some type of uh, plan. We had to dig this up from some of our archives, the, not the most previous in, administration, but the one before that. The Bush administration, there were a lot of immigration rates, a lot more, I should say, uh, of companies. And usually it had to do with places where they were already looking for undocumented workers. Uh, it's likely that those will come back. There's, it's hard to tell at this point uh, on what basis they will be doing these types of investigations. But there should be a plan at a company uh, about who you can let in and who you can't let in and what they have to have. So you know, your question about who you can let in uh, for a site visit. When uh, ICE comes to do uh, a raid or an investigation, they call it enforcement action at a company, they can come with two different kinds of warrants. A warrant that many of us lawyers are used to seeing, which is signed by a judge and says exactly what they're doing. There's a search warrant, and then there's an arrest warrant. An arrest warrant only has to do with a person. And this has happened at, at clients um, and companies. They come and they say, we understand this person works here and we have uh, a warrant for their arrest. Well, they, they can't search the whole place for them. They can only go where they think that person is, and it's to arrest that person, not to search your whole company. Uh, a search warrant, on the other hand, signed by a judge, could lead to them searching um, for anything having to do with certain people that they're looking for. And, but a search warrant will still say the parameters of the search warrant. So you want to make sure that people know what is a warrant, uh, what is a search warrant and an arrest warrant, and make sure that, it, um, that you're keeping them within the boundaries of that, unless you want to give them authority to look wherever they want. The second kind of warrant is an administrative warrant that the Immigration Service uses a lot more. It's an internal document, and most people outside 
of lawyers will think it, you know, because they call it a warrant, that means they can come in and do whatever they want. But an administrative warrant issued by ICE is only an internal document to say, we want to deport this person. If they come and say, we have a warrant to deport somebody, and it's not signed by a judge, an Article III judge, not an administrative law judge, you do not have to let somebody into your company or into your house um, to, to uh, look for that person. It's an administrative warrant. And they will ask and say, can we come in and look for this person? We have a warrant for their deportation. You don't have to do it. You certainly can let them in, but that's only uh, you know, if you consent and you want to do it. And there might be some situations where you might want to do it. But you have to think of a number of different things, you know, who your workforce is, what's it going to look like to the outside, what's the, the messaging for your employees. And it depends on who your workforce is. And some companies are already trying to decide what kind of plan do we have for this kind of thing and, and you know what are the different constituencies that it matters not just obviously the legal consequences of letting somebody in so that's the you know uh, more difficult thing to come up with now but it's a reality um, and you probably have a good idea now whether that's the kind of thing that could happen at any of the uh, facilities that you have we do have a couple of we've gone to the end of our time here so um, I don't think there are any questions from the webinar. Somebody would have told me that. But, um, we'll, so we'll turn off the webinar now, but if there are other people who want to ask questions for a few minutes, and then we're going to uh, have some time to uh, mix and mingle a little bit. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Why don't you do that? And you ask yours. Does it really allow them to remove a person from the workforce when it's not signed by the judge? they actually have that no, they don't. It's only uh, internal administrative authority to take someone into custody if they're allowed to come into your office. So if you consent to them coming in, they can take them into custody and take them to detention. If they were walking down the street, uh, they could use um, an administrative warrant to detain them uh, because they're not in anybody's house or in their, um, there's no expectation of privacy there. But you do have that in most business places. I should say, you know, up to now we haven't dealt with this because there is a memo from the previous administration that prohibits ICE agents from visiting sensitive areas, and that includes uh, places of worship, church, uh, schools, and healthcare facilities. Um, we're not sure if that uh, memo still exists. It was on the website three days ago, but this latest implementation memo says that's gone. So those places might have to worry more. So that's not just employees. Those would be like students or patients at certain places. But at companies, you have an expectation of privacy that you don't have to let them in if they have an administrative warrant for somebody. They might forcefully say they have that, but you don't have to let them in. You could decide to let them in. All right. Uh, the webinar question is, um, is it possible that an executive order could have an effect on the F-1 visa OPT? Uh, again, OPT is the 12 months of work authorization that can be extended out to three years that somebody has when they're on an F-1 student visa uh, and they've graduated. Um, and so uh, a couple of things about that. First of all, no, the OPT comes to us from the written regulations. And so in order to take away OPT, they would have to rescind that part or reform that part of the written regulations, which would take you know, the whole notice and comment process of rulemaking. Uh, so they could go in that direction and try to take away OPT or scale it back. I think they're likely to try to scale it back. Um, but that couldn't be achieved just through an executive order. It would take a whole process to do that, which would take at least 60 to 90 days. So there'd be a lot of notice that that was coming. But, um, but also, it also depends on where a person's from. If you have an F-1 visa from one of these designated countries and you leave the United States and the new travel order comes down, you might be uh, barred from being able to re-enter the United States, which would then, you know, it wouldn't directly attack the OPT. It would just stop you from even being in the United States. Does anybody else have questions in the room? Yes. Um, I'm going to speak to uh, um, that would, yeah, so the question is about uh, a proposal by Cotton to change the balance between family and business immigration. So basically what that does is take away certain categories of family-based immigrant visas. It 
first of all, it gets rid of the diversity visa lottery, the 55,000 um, green cards that way, which would be distributed to other business areas primarily, and also takes away, I think, the ability to sponsor your parent in order to come to the U.S. So if you're over 21 years old and you're a citizen, you currently can sponsor your parent to get a green card in the United States. So it would take away from them. It's not a lot of numbers. It's 55,000 green cards, and I think um, that would be the the parents is a immediate relative category, which doesn't have a cap on it, but they would give some to the business side. So it would be a modicum of increase for business visas. Right now there's a huge backlog for business green cards, so it probably wouldn't resolve the backlog, but it might make Indians and Chinese who have been waiting 10 or 15 years only wait maybe five or six years. Somebody, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question about the Go right ahead. <laughs> I do a lot of TNs for Mexican nationals. I'll repeat the question. Um, so uh, the question is, um, uh, when you get a TN, sometimes the visa, the TN visa and the passport is valid for one year, uh, but then when the person arrives in the United States, they're granted three years of status. And how can that be? Um, well, so first of all, there's the distinction between Canada and Mexico, because ca Canadian citizens and Mexican citizens both qualify for TNs. And so Canadians don't need a visa. So they just enter and they get to three years. Um, so I think your question is mostly about Mexican nationals. And uh, by uh, reciprocity and treaty agreements between Mexico and the United States, Mexico is, uh, citizens are only entitled to one-year TN visas. And so when they go to a US consulate in Mexico and they get their visa, it'll only be valid for one year. But under the NAFTA treaty, they're not similarly restricted to one year of status. They're allowed to have up to three years of status. So as long as they have a valid visa at the time when they're entering the US, uh, they might be given three years. But here's the thing, it's port dependent. So if they fly into the US, they'll almost always get three years uh, from their date of entry. But if they drive across one of the land crossings, they'll usually be restricted to a one year I-94. And as long as they go back, uh, and exit and come back um, before that I-94 expires, then the CBP officer will typically give them another year. Uh, but if they let their I-94, say their I-94 is a day from expiring and they go back to Mexico and they're back in Mexico for a few days, then they try to come back. Now they've got an, an expired TN visa and an expired I-94. They won't let them re-enter. They have to go back to the consulate and get a new visa. See, nothing wrong with our immigration system. You got <laughs> yeah. that? Everybody, that's going to be what we're going to do a test on. And the uh, last question from the webinar side is, do we suggest that companies use E-Verify as soon as possible? That's a toss-up. It doesn't, when, when E-Verify first came out, we said don't do it because there were a lot of downsides to it. There was a lot of false positives in it and caused a lot of employment law issues. Now the data is better. It usually doesn't get things wrong. It just adds a little bit of administrative time when you're doing the I-9 and you have to run somebody through this other uh, program. So it's not as cumbersome as it used to be. It's not as wrong as it used to be. So um, there are some benefits that you gain from it. I can't say a blanket that it's a good idea to do, but it's probably coming down the pike that all companies will have to do it someday. So there's something that says might as well get started now when it's free and easier and uh, maybe you'll already be in the system. And like Eric said, you get sort of a rebuttable presumption that you're doing things right. And that's probably the biggest reason to use it now. Anybody else have questions? One more. There's one customer push for it. If you have large corporate customers, right. that's a good point. If you are a federal contractor or a state contractor, you have to use E-Verify. And now some of those companies who have the requirements themselves, even in their own uh, contracts, you may not be part of their federal contracts. They might just say it as part of your contracting with them that we're not going to contract with you without that. There are some companies, I'll just say at Walmart, who uh, has a, a consent decree with the government where they have to make sure that everyone they do business with has an I-9 process. So if you're contracting with them, you have to uh, certify that you have an I-9 process that works. And so sort of a secondary um, 
process to that is if you just say certify that you're using E-Verify, it's almost like explaining that you're using a whole I-9 process. So it's sort of a shorthand for saying all of our employees are legal as far as we can tell. Of course, it doesn't stop someone who comes in and uses somebody else's identification. You know, my brother and I look alike, and if he uses my ID and comes in, you would never know that um, he's not authorized to work. So there are certain ways to get by it, but many companies are asking for that. Any others? Great. Well, thanks a lot for coming today. Um, no news came out while we were sitting here, so uh, you'll have to come back tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>